God bless you and your family during this holiday season. This is Pastor Duncan saying that God has taken us remarkably through another year. Can you believe that Halloween, Thanksgiving is all gone, Christmas, and we're embarking on a brand new year. But in between, don't you skip Christmas. This time of season is a time of miracles. This time of the year is a time that Jesus Christ our Savior was born. The message that you hear the next two weeks, the one you're going to hear this morning and the one you're going to hear the next week is going to be messages pointing us back, getting our compasses back in the right direction. They're going to be heading due north to the blessings of God. I need you to understand something. God is far from done. Always looking for faithful people like you. I thank you. Shiloh Baptist thanks you. SBC Praise Church. That's our hashtag for our Facebook and our YouTube and our Instagram. We thank you, SBC Praise Church, for joining us. All the friends we made over this time, the devil thought that he was doing something that would stop us, and things have gotten better. So let me say this to you, since the world doesn't say it anymore. Merry Christmas. We need to understand it's all about Christ. I pronounce a prayer of covering over you and your family this Christmas season. Think of good things, and God will provide them. God bless you. 
Enjoy the message. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day and for your word that is about to go forth, Lord. I ask that your anointing be here. Please, God, take me out of myself. And even those that are listening, let them understand that they are anointed vessels of God. And the word coming into their heart is going to strengthen them and build them up and bless them for whatever they're going through at this time. We give you all the glory and honor, Lord. Bless this word. Send down your anointing to keep us strong, healthy, and focused on you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you to grab your Bibles, grab your technology, and just go with me to Luke's Gospel chapter 2. Luke's Gospel chapter 2. And we're going to begin reading at verse 21. And I'm going to read down to verse 35. Luke's Gospel chapter 2. I'm going to begin reading at verse 21 and go down to 25. And when the eight days were fulfilled for circumcising him, his name was called Jesus, which was so called by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of the purification, according to the law of Moses, were fulfilled, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves, two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus, that they might do concerning after the custom of the law, then he received him unto, into his arms and blessed God and said, Now... Let us thy servant depart according to thy word in peace. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And his father and his mother were marveling at these things which were spoken concerning him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the falling and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which is spoken against. Yea, and the sword shall pierce through thine own soul that thoughts out of many hearts may be revealed. Amen. For as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow, walk with me through this text. We're going to talk about what happens when you really see Jesus. I'm not talking about a cursory view. I'm not talking about hearing someone else. What happens when you really see Jesus? Every year, it seems as if the world pushes Jesus further and further away from Christmas. Matter of fact, you can look around at Christmas and it looks like Jesus is nowhere to be found. We used to celebrate good things on Christmas, but now we live in this dark, selfish, divided world that doesn't seem to have room for Jesus. And they don't celebrate like we used to celebrate at Christmas time. We used to celebrate family, fellowshipping. God, good food, 
We used to celebrate helping one another. Anyone who needed help, it was a good spirit of love and joy and peace in the air. Everybody talked about the spirit that existed during Christmas time. Now it seems that all you hear at Christmas is bad news. All you hear is just like the rest of the year, they continue to push bad news as if they don't know a Savior has come. What they push out is uh, the economy is bad, times are hard, things are hard, you can barely make it. And they say stuff like crime is up, jobs are down, and our future doesn't look much better. But that's all a lie. I know somebody out there can tell them that as long as we can remember our Savior at Christmas. The world didn't just get like this. I know misery sells, but the world was bad before. But it seemed like we used to take a break during Christmas and remember that the Savior has come. And to somebody who is struggling, I need you to know something. I need you to know that at this time, if you take your focus off the world, you will understand and see Jesus. And when you see Jesus, something happens. All right, I'm going to let that set in so somebody can tell me. Something happens when you see Jesus. That's the only reason I'm standing here now and you're out there now. Somebody can celebrate right now. Yeah, I know what he's talking about because one day I saw Jesus. It was bad, but thank God for him. And I remember at Christmas the one thing that used to trigger or let us know that Christmas has arrived. And I know you have the same you know, understanding or the, the same kind of perspective that I do, most of us. And because all of us have been kids. And that is when Christmas came, it was how you knew. One of the signs you knew was by Christmas caroling or Christmas singing. And man, we used to sing songs that was just a blessing and brought joy and peace. But I noticed I was preparing for this message that even the songs they sing now, the most popular songs of Christmas, most of them are spreading misery, have no redemptive power. They're redundant. They make people feel bad. And we go around continue to fill up. You know that's how the world makes its money off of pushing what's not good because that keeps them in business. But what they do, even the Christmas songs now, sound like nothing's ever going to get better. Watch, watch the categories. So what they do is this. To people, and it's dumb to me, the people who lost somebody, this year, I, I lost my mother, and I, I, it's even hitting me harder now, and I, I lost my sister. And here's the thing I need you to know, and, and right around the end of December, I lost my mother-in-law last year. And so, why in the world would I want to hear a song reminding me of that? But what they do, they choose people who are hurting, I believe it's a plot of the enemy also, and they start pushing these songs. So what they do is find somebody who has lost somebody, and it's hard without them, and they got a nerve to sing a song talking about Christmas just ain't Christmas without the one you love. Duh. I think we know that. Christmas just ain't Christmas without the one you love. There is no redemptive. You're not giving me any new news. You're not telling me something I don't know. You're just making me feel bad. And for someone who's been a divorce or has broken up in a relationship, they got songs out there now talking about it's going to be a blue, blue Christmas without you. And that's when we put our hopes on folk instead of on God. But they push these songs. And then for somebody who's lonely and wants somebody and has wanted somebody for a while, they make them feel bad because they start singing songs for lonely people. They just they don't even dress it up. They just say, what would the lonely do at Christmas? What do they do? What do they do? You know what's crazy about that? They're pushing misery and want you to be happy about it. We used to sing songs that brought joy. Your life will never change if you listen to what the world is pushing. You need to go back. Come on, go back to the landmark. Go back to the kind of songs. And the only songs that will really talk about the reason for the seasons are songs that lift up Jesus. I'm not the only one that grew up in Sunday school. You remember we went and sang those songs that still bring joy to our heart. The first Noel. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, away in a manger, we three kings, it came upon the midnight clear. We sang songs, little drummer boy. We sang songs that told us about the birth of the Savior. Then when we went to school, even then, we sang songs that made us happy. They were joyous songs. Think about it. When you went to school, we would sing songs like this in school plays. Or there were kids songs out there letting you know to be joyful at Christmas time. We would hear songs out there like uh, Santa Claus is coming to town. Rudolph the Red-Nosed 
uh, reindeer, and we hear some up on the housetop, reindeer calls. We would hear songs about let it snow. We hear songs about I wish you a Merry Christmas. We had songs, all I want for Christmas are my two front teeth. We had songs that made Christmas fun for us. And when I got older, and I start noticing even in the world they had songs of love and, and hope, messages of hope. Because who in the world would have thought that the temptations, which is all all of us know, would make an R&B song that puts, put that kind of put a silent night at a different level. There's not too many people out there that won't groove when you hear that temptation song. Do, 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 do. In my mind. You know what I'm talking about. All of us know the song, and it's something about the temptations making Silent Night an RB hit, but the world was singing Silent Night. And of course, Stevie Wonder, Someday at Christmas, or Donnie Hathaway's song, uh, This Christmas, everybody has made that over. The iconic Christmas song by Nat King Cole, where Nat King Cole is talking about chestnuts roasting on. It was just songs of love. And if you really want to know the message of Christmas, you can even go as far as James Brown trying to help out poor folk. James Brown starts singing Santa Claus, goes straight to the ghetto. All I'm saying is there were songs that made us joyous. And there's one song, as I was looking at this and pondering over this and perplexing over this, about what's going on with Christmas now. Where is that Christmas joy? There was one kid's song, this going to sound strange, so y'all got to go with me, that made me or reminded me of Jesus even though it was a child song, um, the sky, it was an adult song, disguised as a child song. When you, when you hear the song, you know what I'm saying. And it was a song that could still give us some understanding of Jesus. Y'all got to follow me, because that's the mode I'm in right now. Watch this. And the song is, especially with Michael Jackson and the Jackson 5 segment. And the song is, I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. Somebody said, what in the world does that have to do with Christmas? No, it reminds me of Jesus. You got to go because if you remember this song, let me set it up. I haven't lost my mind. Stay with me. When you look at this song, it says Michael is singing and trying to tell the rest of his brothers because he's the only one that saw it. I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. And he's so excited about it that if you know the song, the song starts out, wow. I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. And then he goes into it at the end. Steady telling his brothers, I did. Oh, Michael, come on, get out of here. I did see mommy kissing Santa Claus. And Michael just would not stop because he was startled and amazed. Don't miss those words. I'm very transition. Watch this. He was startled and amazed that he saw mom kissing Santa Claus. And three things happened to him when he saw Santa Claus that if you really see Jesus, they're going to happen to you. First of all, you're going to be startled and amazed. Oh, I got a witness in here that'll tell you, that'll testify. The moment, if you remember when you saw Jesus for who he truly was, when you saw Jesus as your Savior, when you saw Jesus, not the Jesus you were running from, oh, come on, somebody, or the Jesus who you didn't know about, but when you saw his love, when you saw his compassion, when you saw he really cared for you, you dropped down to your knees, and you knew there was something different about this Jesus. And so three things happened to Michael that happened to you when you saw Jesus. Here it was, first of all, he had to start singing. You know, when, when a, a song in our heart, God put a new song. One of the ways that songs take us into a, a rarefied air of anointing is understanding. And let's stay within the Christmas spirit and understand that in Luke's gospel, in the same second chapter, if you go with me to thir verse 13 and 14, you'll find out that the angel came and was telling the shepherds about Jesus Christ and said that Jesus Christ, the baby, had been born. And when the angel came and said Jesus Christ had been born, he was saying that he's in the city of David or Bethlehem. Watch this. And he's there, and this one angel was telling all of them. But when the one angel said, and he's in the city of David in Bethlehem, I believe that the rest of these angels heard that word about that baby and those angels knew that the Savior had been born because the Bible says this in Luke uh, 2, 13 and 14. Look at it. It says suddenly. It starts out with a preposition. And suddenly with that angel there was a multitude, a host of angels praising God and saying glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill to men. The word I want you to put on 
is suddenly. I believe, come on, somebody help me. If a thought comes in your mind suddenly about where God brought you from, suddenly about how you survived, suddenly about the things in your life that God has helped you overcome, there's a song comes on your heart. And singing is a way of blessing us. It's in singing, it says in Ephesians, that we can bring up the anointing of God, making melody in our heart, making merry in our heart. There's power in singing a song. Can I tell somebody something? If you start singing in your worst moment, you know the devil can't stop it. Second thing that happened to Michael, that happened to you when you see Jesus, and that is you can't help but tell somebody. You see Michael saying, but I did see it. No, Michael called, but I did. You got to tell somebody. This reminded me of Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. You remember Jeremiah the prophet? Oh, we've been there, somebody. How many know that there's been times in my life when I've been mad at God, but I knew God still loved me, but God has still been the best thing that ever happened to me. So what Jeremiah said is, he said, I, in verse 9, watch this. He said, I made up in my mind, I was not going to make mention of him, nor speak his name anymore, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary and forbearing, and I couldn't stay. All he said is sometimes you can't help yourself. If you begin to think about Jesus, you got to tell somebody who it is that brought you this far. I'll go deeper than that. How many know that had not been for Jesus on your side even this year? Come on, somebody. Go back with me. If it hadn't been for God, your side during that deepest, darkest time in your life, during that mid during that time you cried and were hopeless. If it had not been for God on your side, have I got at least one person that'll tell me if Jesus hadn't shown up, I would not have made it. But somehow I gotta let somebody know. How did I get here? Jesus. Who paid my bills? Jesus. Who brought me out? Jesus. Come on. Even if you're sitting there suffering, who's keeping me right now? Jesus. So you gotta sing, you gotta tell somebody. And thirdly, what happens is the same thing that happened to him. You are so glad when you figure out Jesus is real. You get excited when you find out Jesus is real. I love this because in order to know Jesus is real, you've got to spend time with him. I'm going to say it again. Some of you don't know Jesus is real because you don't spend any time with him. But when you know Jesus is real is when you spend time with him and you've been in a situation where you saw the realness of God not to let you go. You saw his grace in your life. You didn't deserve it. You saw the mercy. You saw that you know who you were and God still treated you like royalty. Somebody ought to praise him right there because that was a blessing in God for doing that. And what we found out is that when you get to the point that you see God is real, it's like David. You get cursed. It's like David. Uh, uh, when I think about it, uh, 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 let's look at the lepers who were healed. Remember Jesus was gone and he said he'd gone from Jerusalem and he was between and walking, and there was ten leprous men who were outcast and alienated. Sounds like some of us. Maybe somebody's there now. And the Bible said, they said, Jesus, have mercy on us. Heal us. Jesus healed them. And if you look at that 15th and 16th verse, after they was healed, the Bible says, and one of them, when he saw he was healed, turned back. With a loud voice, glorified God, fell down at Jesus' feet, kneeling down, and was grateful because he gave thanks unto God. And the thing was, don't go miss this, he was a Samaritan. I need you to see that. Whole lot of folks say they love Jesus. Whole lot of folks want to be called by Jesus' name. But it's a few people that really see Jesus. Some of you have not seen what we've seen. I've seen people ask me, why are you so excited? You must not have seen the God that I've seen. That's what Christmas is about, an encounter with God. God came to be face to face. God wants to be there where you are now. God wants to dry every tear from your eye. God wants to answer prayers you have not even spoken yet. God wants to be with your children if they're hurting this year. God wants to do a miracle in your life. Somebody better claim some of this. God wants to make sure that you don't go under, but you're going to rise up. Can you grab that? God wants to make sure that you hold on to him no matter how bad it gets because he's never going to let go of you. God said, Two things God did on Christmas that bless us. He said, I want you to have a great life now. I want to give you some right now blessings. God said, I'm gonna, look, this is not all about getting to heaven. God is a God that gives you some right now blessings. Somebody ought to praise God for the right now blessings. Because he blesses us 
with the things we need now. And secondly, he said, I'm going to bless you with a resting place in eternity. I'm going to bless you to make it through this life. Oh, somebody, God just told me, the thought went through your mind, but God told me to tell you, you're going to make it. Somebody shout that back at me right now. You're going to make it because you got a God on your side. That's what Christmas is all about. How does he do that? Those two great things he wants to do. First, God wants to give you power to reach your destiny. That's what's wrong with some folk as we head into our new year. You're walking in a life that you know is not your destiny. But how many know it's not too late for God to turn your destiny around? And he will give you power. Hear me, somebody. God will give you power to handle your destiny. You say, Pastor, but I'm going too far. Things are too far down. God said, I will give you power to handle your destiny. What do you mean? Joshua found himself. In the fifth chapter of Joshua, they had just gotten to Gilgal, and they were looking across the Jordan River at Jericho. And the Bible tells us that Joshua had not been set up by God, had not been raised by God to be the leader, but he was charged with leading these stiff-necked people across the Jordan River. And can you see Joshua? Because it says in that fifth chapter, around the 12, 13, 14 verse, it said that Joshua went out there, and he started looking across the river at Jericho. I can imagine in his mind, he was wondering, how am I going to do this? You ever wonder that? How? And all of a sudden, a captain of the Lord's host showed up. Joshua saw this. He didn't know it was angel. He said, well, whose side are you on? And it was the captain of the Lord's host. And you know what he said to Joshua? I'm talking about destiny. Watch this. He looked at Joshua in the 15th verse and said, uh, take your shoes off your feet. For the ground you are standing on is holy. And Joshua did so. When you read that verse, God established Joshua after his beatings. He was battered. He had seen all Moses went through. But God gave him power to conquer his destiny. And they conquered Jericho. And finally, he came to give us strength for our battles. Don't you dare think about running off. Because God will give you strength for your battle. Now we'll talk about David in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I don't have to go there. You know what happened. David spent time with God. I'm still talking about when you really see him. Can you imagine David by himself alone, a shepherd, watching sheep, all kind of predators and animals coming around. But David sitting there getting more and more faith in God. And David singing songs in the night to God. And as David was doing all of this, when the animals came and attacked, David got stronger in the Lord. He really saw Jesus. Watch this. And here is what happened to David. When Goliath challenged God's people, he went to Saul and said, I'll fight him. And Saul, if you remember the conversation Saul had with him, he said, you're nothing but a boy. He is a man of war. You can't beat him. And I want you to look at that 37th verse. David said, no, but listen, the same God, moreover, who took me out of the paw of the lion, took me out of the paw of the bear, allowed me to defeat them, is the same God that will help me defeat the hand of this Philistine. And Saul told David to go. What happened? David got strength for the battle he was in. Let's look at this text. I need you to get excited about Christmas. Come on, get your focus off the bad stuff. And I want you to see one of the most overlooked stories at Christmas. Simeon is one of my favorite characters because he displays a trait that all of God's children need in order to be delivered. And anybody who's been delivered will tell you this is the trait I've had to have. You know what that is? I had to wait on God. Waiting was not fun, but when I waited on God, I learned, I grew, I got frustrated, almost cussed. I know, I know none of y'all, but you know what I'm saying? There was days when I was so angry, I didn't know what to do. But Simeon will show us how important it is to understand that when you really see Jesus, prosperity comes. No, no, I'm not talking about where you are right now. You haven't seen God. When you see God spiritually, I'm not talking just not with your physical eye. I'm talking about in your heart when you see his compassion, his power, when you see the fact that not only does he love you unconditionally, but he's already made a way for you. Can I give you three points in this message and we'll keep on? I'll alliterate like a good back preacher should. And I want you to write these down and I'm going to try to hit all three and I'll be out of your way on this Christmas. But this is Christmas the baby, our Savior, Jesus Christ, has been born. The background of this text. 
the, th the three points are, um, if you want to be the person you really see Jesus, you got to start looking for what God has promised. Mm. You got to start looking for what God has promised to you. You started, You got to start embracing. I know, I know you're weak right now, but you got to embrace those promises. We're talking about Simeon. And then you have to celebrate what God has promised. I know somebody's writing a good scholar out there. You have to learn in your home to start looking for what God has promised. You got to embrace what God has promised and celebrate. The background of this text is if you look at most biblical theologians will tell you that the, the Christmas story is in Luke's gospel and it's in Matthew's gospel. And most uh, biblical scholars believe that uh, Matthew was writing about Joseph's genealogy, because both start with a genealogy, and Luke was writing about Mary's genealogy. Matthew wrote uh, from Joseph, who was Jesus' uh, legal, uh, legal father, right, all the way down to uh, David's son Solomon, and uh, Luke wrote from Mary, who was Jesus' real blood, down to David's second son of Nathan. But they wrote about making sure we understood the power in the birth of Christ and why he came. Stay with me. And now they were going to the temple, as this text said, to fulfill the eight days. Look at verse, look at verse 21. And when the eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus. So the angel uh, before him, was con as he was conceived in the womb, they were told it was going to be called Jesus. Jesus, the eight days. If you read verse 21 to 24, it gives us the background to why uh, Mary and Joseph were at the temple. Leviticus chapter 12, verses 2 through 4, tells us that after, um, after the birth of a young man, after the birth, that the child has to be dedicated and that Mary has to be dedicated and purified. They were called the rites of purification. So three of them are listed in this text. The first one is after eight days, every male child that opens the womb has to be circumcised. This is following the law of God. Sometimes it gets me that folk want to listen to a message and you want to tap into a message, but you have no outside obedience to the message once the message is over. God said there are, I know we're not under the law right now, but we are still under the understanding that we have to follow our shepherd, that God does something decent and in order. I don't know why I'm saying this, but somebody, you would have gotten your deliverance a long time ago if you had just been obedient, if you could just sacrifice, if you could just hold on. Because that's what Mary and Joseph was doing. You know the trouble how Jesus was born. And all of a sudden, they want to make sure that because of the rumors that had gotten around about Mary sleeping around with somebody else, they wanted to make sure that this baby was a good Hebrew Jew, that he was following all the laws. They wanted to show it. So they went to the temple after the eight days so that Jesus could be circumcised. Then after 40 days, as we go through this text, it says that, and that's Leviticus where it says, and Mary after 40 days had to be purified. And so did Jesus. Look at verse 24. said they had to offer it by the law a pair of turtle doves and some young pigeons. And then they started with making sure Jesus was Fine, but here is where our text gets interesting. He was looking for the promise of God. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? Are you looking for some magic without a connection? Are you looking for God to do something that you don't have the faith for him to do? If that's your plight, you ought to see Simeon. You ought to see the connection because verse 25 tells us, And behold, there was a man of Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same was a just and devout man, waiting for the consolation of Israel. The Holy Ghost was upon him. Simeon shows us right off the bat. That you have to be the kind of person looking for your blessing. There's a lot of believers, you've heard promises a thousand times, but you never really looked for that promise until you were hurt. You didn't try to live that promise. Simeon was in the posture of saying, I'm waiting on God because everything God says will come true. I want to echo that to somebody. Everything God says will come true. Have I got a witness in here? It may not come true in my time when I want it to, but won't God bring to pass? what he said. Hear me tonight. Everything, everything that God says will come to pass. It says Simeon, the word used, he was constantly in the state 
of looking and pursuing the power of the promise of God. He had the place of Jacob when the angel grabbed him and he said, let me go. And, and when God said, let me go, he said, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. Do I have somebody out there with that kind of stamina, that kind of resolve who will say, I'm not letting go until I get my blessing. Because when you do that, it's someone who is uh, joyful about the things of God. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, a verse, a book that has blessed all of us with peace and joy. In that verse it says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The problem with some of us is you can't look with God with a complaining negative attitude. You got to shake yourself and believe that what God has done. You're grateful for it. You believe in it. So the reason you're smiling is because you know that it's true. When you know it's true, you don't have to worry about if God's going to do what he says. You just know that he is. The kind of person who gets a blessing is the person who rejoices in God. Have I got somebody rejoicing out there? And rejoicing takes place when things don't look good. Rejoicing doesn't take place. Some of you are in a perfect place this morning to rejoice. You got to be grateful for what God has done. The Lord showed me something that most people are going to put God first until after they get blessed. Then all of a sudden they're excited about God. Even for a couple of days, a couple of months. But here is where you miss the blessing of God. Um, you don't bless God or put God first because he blessed you. You put him first because that's how you get blessed. Your blessing doesn't come to God because uh, he blessed you. Your blessing comes from God because you put him first. You want to get blessed first, then put God first. God said, no, if you put me first, the blessing will come. And many people have lost the ability of putting God first. I find a whole lot of saints who don't pursue God until they're in trouble. In Berlin, at an art gallery, is a painting by the German painter, painter Adolf Menzel. The only, it's an only partially finished work in Germany. Watch this. And what he was going to do is put Frederick the Great, the king at this time, in a picture with all of his generals uh, and in the background, all of those who were his leaders and officers. Well, what Menzel did was started by painting all the background scenes. He painted the officers and the generals, and then he painted all the other items that needed to be in the picture. And then he put a chalk outline of Frederick the King, because he was going to put him in last. But if you look at the painting, what's significant about it is that he died before he could fill in the picture. Oh, stay with me, somebody. The picture of the king. Here he has an outline of the king for the center, but you couldn't see him. That's right. I just got you. Did you get it? Here's what happened. A lot of people are going to die. A lot of believers are going to die. And you never really seen Jesus because you wait till last to try to put Jesus first. Help me, somebody. Right now, you didn't put Jesus first, so you'll never understand those of us who know Because when I put Jesus first, it seems like I come through anything. And I come through anything, sometimes unscarred and unscathed. And even when I come through scarred up, he dries the tears from my eyes and heals every wound, every wound in my body. Most Christians will come to the light you've never seen Jesus. People who get blessed and see Jesus are those with expectations. Expectations come from what you know, not what you hear. Can I say it again? You can't expect to get blessed by just listening to preaching if you don't read your word yourself. You can't see other people getting blessed and try to claim their exuberance and their excitement and act like you're going to be blessed. No, you got to go know God for yourself. Paul said in 2 Timothy 1 and 12, he said, For which cause I suffer all these things, and I am not ashamed. Oh, I don't have time to unpack that. Paul said, For which cause, 2 Timothy, watch this, 1 and 12, For this cause uh, uh, I suffer all these things, and I am not ashamed, because I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against the evil day. Paul was telling us that, yeah, as a Christian, you might see me suffer, but it won't take away my joy. 
You might see me going through stuff, but I'm not ashamed because at the end of the day, my God said he's going to show up and I know he will show up. So I'm sitting comfortable. Yeah, I'm scarred, but I'm comfortable. Anybody with me? I've learned to be comfortable, uncomfortable because on the way is some help coming from the Lord, my God. I'm sitting here now. Don't have everything, but God sure is on the way. Can somebody write down, God is on the way. And that's how you got to know. You got to know that you know that you know. You can't sit around hoping somebody else tells you. And that's because Simeon was waiting on God. Can you see this figure? Sitting at the temple every day. I mean, he was sitting at the temple every day. I guess some people walked by and said, what is he doing? And he would tell them, I'm waiting on the Messiah. The Messiah is coming. How do you know it's going to be here? How do you know it's going to happen here? Simeon had a trust. He had a faith. He had a connection with God and said, I know. Oh, God told me to tell somebody, you got to know in your heart of hearts. You cannot know unless you see him. You remember the woman with the issue of blood, how she tried many things to get healed, and yet, after trying many things to get healed when none of them work, once she got that vision of Jesus, the Bible said nothing was going to stop her from getting to Jesus. No, it was. She had no plan B. She said, I'm going to get to Jesus. She went after Jesus, but hear how she went. She was expecting something to happen. Can I tell you how expecting this woman was? She didn't just want to touch Jesus. She was expecting enough power to come from touching something that touched Jesus. She just wanted to touch Jesus, him of his glory. She didn't need to touch the Messiah. She said, if I can just get close enough to touch his him, and her expectation, her power blessed her. That's why sometimes we need to be around folk who are excited about Jesus Christ and keep getting expectations. So what does it say in that verse 25? Four things about Simeon that made him able to keep looking. And we're going to tackle them real quick, and I'm going to go to my second point, and I'll be out of your way. Watch this. He actually, the text says he was a just man, he was a devout man, he was filled with the Holy Ghost, and he was waiting on the constellation of Israel. This is how you look, this is how you stay strong while you're looking. He was a just man, he was a devout man, uh, he was filled with the Holy Ghost, and he was waiting on the constellation of Israel. Look at that, it's in that text. What he's saying is, first he was a just man. I'm going to mess somebody up right here. Just, just me, you got to be a good person. Some of you are not blessed because you just not a good person. You want to be holy when you're not even good. You sit around and want to lay hands on folk. You want to prophesy. You want to get in church and shout. And then you made a practice out of not treating people well. You made a practice out of not being, you don't even care if you're a good person or not. You haven't even figured out that the law of reciprocity has been messing up your blessings all your life. You've been reaping what you sowing. You can't look for a promise or say excited about God when all you think about is yourself. You got to be a good person. Person. Many Christians have made uh, uh, God off the limits to folk who are searching just by your action and your attitude. I'm just telling somebody out there, you know in your heart whether you're a good person. And don't get mad at me for saying it because you know whether you mean and hateful and scornful and hold grudges. You know if you do that. So first of all, we know Simeon was a good man. I believe when they saw Simeon there, he probably was polite, spoke to everybody, happy to everybody. So some of y'all need to know that people already know, nah, uh-uh, don't go mess with her. Ain't, ain't no Jesus in him, don't go there. Second, he was a devout man. Devout means that he loved God. Uh, nobody could pull him away from the love of his Savior. He was uh, contented with just being in love with God. He knew that the love of God would open all the other doors of his life because it was like Joseph who, who had a right to be angry when he was sold into slavery uh, by his brothers all because he loved God and had a vision for God. He could have gotten angry with God, but a devout person understands that I got so much love and faith in God that I'm not going to do anything to disappoint God. Can I pull the covers off of some folk who want you to think they're real holy? You know the only reason a lot of us, even pastors, I'll tell you myself, we are constrained and restrained from doing things, not because of our own good nature, but because we don't want to disappoint God. There's a whole lot of stuff I would do. Not, and I'm talking about with all the word I know, with all the preaching I've done, there's a whole lot of times sin is right there. Come on, help me somebody. Sin, and the only reason I don't act on it, I don't move on it. Can I get an honest person? It's because I'm 
restrained by what I know about the Word of God. And I'm, that's what makes me act right. Because I'm in love with God. And when you're devout, God loves it when you love Him because He already loves you. Uh, this husband and wife had their sixth wedding anniversary and their house burned down to the ground. And they were being sorrowful, but they got a chance to go into the blackened pile and pick up whatever was left. So the woman wanted to get in there and collect all the pictures of the family. And she was joyful because she ran over to her husband and said, all oh, the pictures were saved. The pictures were saved. And he got those pictures. And when he got the pictures, of, when she got the pictures, she noticed he didn't even hear him. Because he was knelt down on the ground, y'all. And she noticed some charred, burnt letters in his hand. And when she looked at the burnt letters in his hand, she said, what is that? He said, these are the love letters I wrote you. She thought to herself, I know we were meant to be together. And I know that man loves me because here we are, instead of looking around for material things, we were looking around for the things that has promoted the love, the most important things in our lives. He wanted to preserve the love that we felt when we got together. All of those kind, sweet words he said to me, that was more important than trying to find insurance papers and the will and any jewelry. He said, I got to find the one I love. Every now and then, you got to take yourself off this earthly plane and you got to tell yourself, I got to find with me. I gotta find out am I keeping close to my heart the most important thing and that's my love for God. He was filled with the Holy Ghost y'all. Filled with the Holy Ghost said that most of us don't understand that power can't flow out of you unless you're filled and you can't be filled with the Holy Ghost until you understand one thing about being filled. Come on go with me. Acts chapter 1 verse 4. You know it very well. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. That's where the, uh, Jesus was about to be ascended and he assembled all his disciples and he told them they should not leave Jerusalem but that they should wait for the promise of the Father. And then he told them later, you know, you shall receive power, be my witnesses, you know, Jerusalem, the uttermost parts of the world. But watch this. The one piece we miss, you can't be filled with the power if you don't learn how to wait on God before you move. Hmm. As if filling is demonstrated by you not moving in your own mind or by your own desires, but you wait to make sure that I've heard from God. When I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I don't do anything that God doesn't direct me to do. It's that thing, when you move, I move just like that. God is saying, don't you move till I tell you to move. Some of you got a feeling, but you walked away from the very thing that would have had the Holy Spirit power flowing out of your life. You got to learn something about being filled with the Holy Ghost. It is a process. Doesn't happen overnight. There's some tears involved in this thing. There are some, some dark moments where you want to give up involved in getting filled. There are some times when people turn their back on you. When you get filled, there's harsh words that come at you. When you feel filling all this good stuff you walk around, prophesying, no, that's just the fruit of it. The hard part is when you got to wait and take it back up and be with God. And sometimes you want to go to a party, but you got to spend your time writing a message. Or you want to go to a movie or go to dinner, but inside you hear God saying, no, if somebody needs to be saved, write my word tonight. And you got to sit there and write it. And lastly, he was waiting on the consolation of Israel. The word consolation is the name they gave to the coming of the Messiah. That's what it means. So when, the, when he was waiting on this Messiah, he said, I'm going to wait until Jesus shows up. Now, I just gave you the formula for getting the best blessings in your life. You got to trust and believe that Jesus is going to show up. I'm not that. Remember when Daniel went to the lion's den? He went there. The lions were there. Everything was there. But he really believed that when he got in that den, Jesus was going to show up. How many of you believe when I go to the hospital for that operation? I'm, I'm going to be glad to see my doctor. Hey, doc. But I know Jesus is coming because he promised me. How many know when I, when I go to the bank and stuff ain't right with my money, I still know the bill's going to be paid. I'm going to wait on Jesus till I see the, you know, the bottom line put me in the black. How many times has God done that? The second point is you got to embrace it. Verse 27, it said, and he came to the 
uh, temple when the parents brought the child Jesus there. I like this. Do you understand? That wasn't a guess, but that wasn't luck. It says Simon had this divine impulse to believe that this was the precise day that Jesus was going to show up. And the Bible says, and the way it's written, it says, and when Mary and Joseph, the parents, they weren't really the parents, it was the legal parents, we know Jesus was virgin birth, but the parents brought him there, it says that he embraced the gods. To be able to see Jesus, oh, you gotta embrace God's perfect timing. I want to tell somebody something. If you don't embrace God's time, you're going to get frustrated. If you don't really believe in your heart that God knows what he's doing, you'll never really walk with him. It's almost like when I was growing up with my parents, it wasn't until I became a parent, have I got a witness, that I realized my parents were some smart somebody. They knew what they were doing. They paid bills with less money I had. They fed us with less food than I've ever bought. We got to go to grocery market and buy loads and loads. And now, you, now in New Jersey, you can't even put food in bags. You got to take bags to the grocery store with you. We walking around, didn't bring enough bags. And yet our parents who trusted God believed in God's perfect timing. Here is what they believed, and you write this down. God's got a blessing, you heard it here, with your name on it this morning. But you got to believe God's timing. I know Christmas is tough. And I know some of the things they want to sing about are real. But I believe God's timing is on the way. He's got a perfect blessing for you. The Bible said with Mary and Martha, uh, I don't know if you know that Mary and Martha lost a little something with Jesus. I mean, he loved them, but they, they made him cry. Because here he is walking with them, and he thought they saw him. That's what God says about you sometimes. He walking, and he thought you saw him, and yet you fall apart at the, as soon as something happens. Oh, let, let me hurry, let me hurry. And it says that um, when Jesus asked them, the first thing they said, if you'd have been here, Jesus said, don't you believe that even now I'm the resurrection and life I can bless him? Oh yeah, we know he's going to be blessed, you know. No, now! Somebody, God told me to tell you tonight, trust his timing. Somebody ought to talk back to me. My blessing is on the way. God has the timing. And the text says, here's the middle of the text. It says that Simeon walked over to the boy and blessed him. He embraced him. That's what that means. Uh, the, the word that he sang was a Latin term, which means when he began to sing in that prayer, is a Latin term called uh, where he was telling him that now, Lord, you can dismiss me. Watch this. Or I'm released from trying to live on my own. I've seen what you can do. And Lord, this day, I don't want to be released from my burdens or released from that. I want to be released from trying to live my life my own way because I just saw you. Oh, I just saw you, Jesus. I don't have to worry about how my life going to go anymore. I just saw you, Jesus. So everything's going to be all right. You got to embrace the Lord. Oh, uh, it's not a little thing. Embrace it. Can I go to my last point? You got to embrace the Lord. Follow this text. Simeon is powerful. It says you first must be looking for what God promised. Then you got to embrace the promise. He picked Jesus up and held him. And the Bible said once he held him, he started blessing him. Here's the last point. You got to celebrate. Look at verse 30. For my eyes have seen the salvation which you prepared. A light to the Gentiles. Glory to the people of Israel. And Joseph and Mary were marveling at what he said. But he said, this child will be set for the rise and fall of many. And then he said, Mary, even a sword is going to pierce your heart. Can we close this out with this understanding of something? The best thing you can do once you see Jesus, really see him, and know that he's been sent here for the blessing and the best blessing in your life, knowing this Christmas is going to be followed by better Christmases, knowing that God always makes everything better. The first thing in that text, it says, you got to celebrate. Why? Because you've seen his salvation. Some of you are being sad. Man, you must have forgot what you've already seen. Can you at least bless God that you got some proof that God will deliver? you got some proof that God can be a healer. you got some proof that God can keep you from going crazy when you should have went crazy. you got some proof that God can fix a broken situation and turn
turn it around. Second, it says he's going to be a light to the Gentiles. That's us, y'all. And his glory will keep us. All it's saying is that once you see his salvation, next celebrate his light. That you're no longer walking in darkness. You know how to get out of your bed and get on your knees and say a prayer. You know how to wake up in the morning and know that God is right there to answer and hear you. You know how to get a connection. Even if you forgot three or four days, you know how to come back and get that connection. Somebody ought to shout it out. Let somebody know. I've seen that supernatural God. I've seen what he's able to do. I've seen God take nothing from nothing and make something. I've seen God make a way out of no way. I've seen God do things that nobody can understand. I've seen the marvel of his goodness. I watch God build a church. I watch God renew another church. I watch God move our church seven different times and give us a permanent home when folks said the economy wouldn't hold it. I've seen what God can do. His light is in my life. You gotta celebrate that because that's who God is. Some of y'all give it up. This pandemic has zapped your strength. And thirdly and most importantly, she told Mary, this child is set for a rise and fall. When you celebrate him, you're going to be my witness to show other people that he's able. So yeah, go through your trials celebrating. Go through your stuff letting him know that I know God's going to come through for me. Rise and fall. It's going to expose the heart of folk, those that will choose him at Christmas and not. And last time you need to know it said that the sword is going to go through your heart. Somebody out there, God said, ooh, that's nothing. The sword that pierces your heart. He was letting Mary know that his son was going to be crucified. But by being crucified, he's going to rise with more power. He's letting us know that the things that happen to you are going to happen for the furtherance of the gospel. For the furtherance of your heart in your life. And when you really see Jesus, things happen. Longevity. Peace that pass understanding. Words come out of your mouth that you don't know where they came from. Falling apart on the inside talking about but God. All of that happens when you really, really see Jesus. Simeon waited. He said, I was looking for the promise. I embraced the promise. And now I celebrate the promise. And that is Christmas. God bless you. This Pastor Duncan said, don't forget to tune in next Sunday on our birthday party. There's a special word from the Lord. But you need to understand right now. I feel it. God already told me somebody out there just received it. And that is you got to go start practicing searching for God with some expectation, with some joy. You got to practice embracing God no matter what it looks like. And you got to practice celebrating the promises until they are yours. God bless you. Have a blessed day. Open to him and leave it there. I was down, but with a no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free I tried it for myself and now I know what he did